that you eat and squat. So I'm definitely watching and looking and make sure everybody's still awake. I'm just short now, so we're going to jump right in. I was told by the organizers uh, this is not a shy group. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in with the, with the first uh, group of questions. What I love about the panel is we've got such excellent representation. We've got policy, ed tech, the employer perspective, and a really high-performing, ambitious uh, nonprofit. So with that, uh, I'd love to just start, we'll go in this order, and have each of you reflect um, just on this question. Uh, what skills, training, education, credentials are required to get a good job and then continue to grow a good career? And I'll start with you. Is yes an appropriate answer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, it, it's so hard to answer what that is because at any point in a career and in a life, that'll change. And I think that's the thing that we too often miss, that it's a one-shot opportunity. You need these kind of skills at the early part of your career, these kind of skills as you change careers, these kind of credentials as you move on up, and it always has to be continuing and growing, and we need to add them together. I, I couldn't agree more. I'll add one more thought that the world's changing pretty quickly. The right answer today is not going to be the right answer later. And the interplay between what employers need and what the student needs or the employee needs is also really important. It, somebody's thinking very short term, somebody's thinking much longer term, I hope. Thank you, and I, I know where you're headed with that. Um, let me move on to you, Maurice. Look, I'll just add to that, I'll say a couple of things. One, um, a skill that you need is you need curiosity. You need to be curious because it's all about learning. Um, and then um, you need the ability to actually uh, forge relationships, relationships with peers, relationships with mentors and coaches, relationships potentially with customers. Um, so I'll just I'll land on those two for now. Thank you, Maurice. Um, yesterday, uh, I came in a day early, and we heard uh, a great panel from Climb Higher. And I was so struck by what the folks that have been through that program had to say about the value of the program. And a lot of it was contained in what you just said. Uh, all right, Bettina. You know, I would, I would echo what's been said around this combination and confluence of skills that are required at one point in one's career is going to be very different in someone's later career. So fundamentally, having the desire and motivation to learn, having resilience, being able to overcome challenges and barriers, that's a fundamental skill that is going to serve somebody well no matter what career path or learning path they choose. Thanks. OK, so now we'll just go popcorn. And someone in the audience will make sure we stay balanced among the four of you. Uh, what is your organization learning? Each of you leads quite distinct organizations. What are you learning about skills development for learners and workers? And I guess relatedly, when you look at the, the five of us, so I suppose I'm, re I hope I'm representing disruptive higher education, uh, where do you see opportunities for collaboration? So what are you experiencing in your individual sectors? And when you look at this panel, where do you see opportunities for collaboration? and just lean in as you've got something to say. We're learning that complexity is bad, that most of the solutions out there are really clunky for companies and for students. And uh, figuring out how to internalize that, do what Apple would do, mm -hmm. right, and make it something simple for the user is harder than it looks. It's why there's so few Apples. So let me open it up, and I'd love to have you come back, John, and just say, you know, I always, if you were a wizard and we had another three hours, how would you how would you respond to that? And I not with you know specifically around Noodle, but just so what would we do? So who else has a has a reaction? Go for it. So I often think about doors in policy and in in our systems. We make learners and people choose door one or door two, and that adds to that complexity, right? It makes people not be able to connect between the two. And if I were a wizard and had many more than three hours, I think solving that and widening that path so that people can go through door one and door two and not either or, and we don't make it so hard for them to make that choice. So maybe with, with that, I'm picturing those doors, we have, you know, 
a hundred doors at my college and we're trying to simplify. Uh, Maurice, when you listen to what your two colleagues have offered so far, where would you engage uh, the employer voice in the, this, in the this employer question? employer voice? Yeah. Look, I, I think, um, look, I think our big learning is this isn't about the employer voice or the talent's voice. It's about the ecosystem that you need, right? You need the employer, you need the talent, you need um, organizations that can help that talent uh, continue to skill, reskill, and upskill, and you need wraparound supports. You need childcare, you need transportation, you need financial literacy. And so, what the employer, if you were just focusing on the employer, what the employer can do is understand the holistic opportunity and demands of the talent and work on mobilizing the community colleges, the empowers, uh, the other employers, uh, et cetera, that are needed to really create an ecosystem where people are getting prepared, getting into employment, and continuing to advance. Right? That's what I see. I would, I would build on that uh, with one of the things that we're learning, and particularly post-pandemic, when so many have fallen through the cracks, is the importance of the continuum. And to allow for seamless transitions so that individuals can be guided, whether that is from high school to work, high school to college, or to a workforce training program, um, without skipping a beat. But what that requires all of us to do is partner very, very differently. Mm -hmm. You know, we engaged uh, with Urban Alliance to produce some digital uh, credentialing for high school students that will help them get a job or do better in college or be ready for a program like Empower. And it's just thinking more intentionally and innovatively about partnership that I think is gonna define at least so much of what we at Empower do over the course of the next 10 years. To some degree though, those partnerships, what you're describing, that ecosystem, is hard and complex, and the and partnerships themselves are kind of endothermic. You have to just keep putting energy into them. The, the question is, what's the network backbone? What's the thing that makes it simple for people to become part of that ecosystem? Because it doesn't just happen. No, it doesn't just happen, but when you bring leaders together, particularly in a forum like this, where we can engage and understand where there are gaps and opportunities, we can make it happen, and without a lot of friction. Any follow-up to that exchange? Well, I, it definitely <laughs> doesn't just happen. You do need uh, intentionality. You need organization or organizations. You need people, you need leaders who truly want to knit these folks together or these organizations together uh, and to actually keep them together long enough to have impact. Um, but that's no different than any other problem in our country. Um, there's no problem I know that one sector by itself can solve. Uh, no problem worth pursuing. So the notion that it's hard, you know, let me be provocative, that's a weak sort of response. Of course it's hard. <laughs> it's our job. Well, that's, that's why we're you know, here. Well, the way to make it easy it's or if it hadn't been hard, though, we would have done it by now. We would have done it, but I'm saying each player can't have the responsibility for being the backbone. The backbone of, a, well, of an fair. ecosystem is that's fair. itself a thing. That's fair. So, but I would throw out that the backbone of the ecosystem are the learners. And if we put learners, not from a process standpoint for sure, but by centering on who learners are, and I think that's where, at least in the policy circle, I'm seeing the greatest shift of we're suddenly talking about that adult learner, the person who's on a nonlinear pathway through higher education, who needs childcare in addition to tuition assistance. That is the, the conversation, and I think where we can more easily unite in those okay. very unique partnerships, because once we start try, stop trying to put a round peg in a square hole and start saying, oh no, this is a square peg that needs to go in the square hole, the, these are the kind of learners that we're trying to solve it changes the friction in some of those partnerships with innovators and disruptors, as well as with the existing established institutions and systems we already have. 
So I think a lot about measurement. And the question, you, you've got a bunch of organizations taking different pieces of this problem. And to some degree, whether you're working with middle school kids to get them the math and reading skills, whether you're working with high school kids on counseling, college kids on retention, uh, uh, people who've dropped out on coming back, there are actually some simple metrics we could implement on return for, on investment of how much money is the organization putting in, what's the control group, and what's the number of college grads who come out the other end versus control. My gut is that it costs about $25,000 to create an additional college grad. And, and that seems like a big number, and so people are loath to talk about it, so they come up with, each org comes up with its own vanity metrics. What's the org that says, I'm gonna create the metrics and I'm gonna to work to enforce them. So I love where you're going, um, and I agree with you actually, at least spitballing about the 25, and at least in the public sector, I've yet to find at scale folks that are willing to pay that for our students, the students that we serve in the community college space, but I think your number is in the, is in the right realm. I think where I'd like to, um, and it also makes me think about ASAP. So if we've got any people from CUNY, you know, I've been at, in Rhode Island for six years. I've put that data in front of every legislator that I can put it in front of. If you are simply looking at the kind of metric you're talking about, it is cheaper for the legislature to invest, and frankly, it's not $25,000, but that added additional costs, you know, we haven't, we haven't seen ASAP be able to scale without bringing in, you know, external third-party funders. And it goes back to what we were talking about behind the stage, right? The, how do we do this work at scale? So think, um, I've got a bunch of questions. I'm I've got 13 minutes, so we gotta get off this stage. Um, it, Maurice, I would, um, as someone who thinks a lot about vehicles to serve the new majority learner, um, I clearly think about community colleges. Um, I also think about employers, and then everyone else at this panel for the work you do to get us where we're trying to go. Maurice, I'd love to go back um, to what you said a few minutes ago about, I'll call them uh, progressive employers, and you're leading a group of them, who are understanding, I think, in a deeper way than historically they have, what it actually takes to be a successful learner, whether that's in college, whether that's in one of your training programs. They understand uh, the costs that formerly were described as hidden. They're only hidden to people that aren't actually uh, facing them. What do you, when you think about the organizations you're leading, uh, how are folks getting their arms around solving for that cost? So again, in my, you know, thinking about what I do and my colleagues in the, in the community college space, um, we're looking for solutions to that question because our budget and our tuition is not going to cover that. Yeah, so I, what we're seeing um, is employers paying some of that cost, but also finding other partners who are uh, paying some of that cost. And so there's a, there's a risk sharing, if you will, that we're seeing across the coalition. Um, so you have employers, you have community colleges, you have philanthropy, you have government, you've got a number of different places that um, are sharing costs. You've got We've got for-profit um, organizations that are figuring out how to, frankly, generate a business model off of this work as well. Um, so the employers are not doing it alone. Uh, what we're seeing, the ones that are most effective are the ones that realize that they need the expertise, they need the capacity, they need the partnerships, uh, they need the brand of other partners in the community, and they are aggressively bringing those folks to the table. So I love where you went, and Bertina, I was gonna to go to you next, um, because it, maybe I'm intuiting it, but I'm hearing from you um, the belief that it is possible to build these kinds of partnerships. So I wonder if you can say a little bit about your own experience leading your organization and just how you might lean into where Maurice brought us to. Yeah, so I'll, I'll share an example of a partnership with a corporate partner that I think speaks to that way in which some companies are thinking about that return on investment, but also just briefly mention a partnership with Dallas College, right? You know, to this point around the continuum and what you were saying, it's not door one or door two. 
our students are earning college credits. They're not enrolled in Dallas College, but we're reaching into communities of students today who are not considering college an option. But once they get those credits, and once they get a job and realize, oh, this degree is going to be valuable, well, Dallas College is an accessible place for them to get their degree. So I think that that is a way in which we can scale some of our offerings. It becomes not either or or both and, rather both and. But as I think about the corporate partnership, you know, if I, if I go back to systems and the backbone, sometimes the leaders are within our corporate partners who themselves may have that more non-traditional background and experience, who say, I want to bring in somebody who doesn't have a college degree. And a gentleman I talked to last week from a large defense contractor said, I know how to build great engineers. They don't necessarily have to have a college degree. He himself doesn't have one. But he said, what I'm looking for is baseline fundamental skills, maybe a certification program, but motivation, an eagerness to learn, ambition, and a sense of loyalty that this person's going to be with this company for more than 18 months. Yeah. right? And so when you have that kind of attitude, this is a company that typically doesn't hire those without college degrees, yeah. he's making a difference. Because now they're saying, the whole company is saying, well, this guy's doing a really great job and he's getting excellent results. Maybe we should relax that requirement across the board. So I love where you went, and John, I know I'm going to turn it to you. So here is, um, I will say I've unto, I've, I'm of two minds. And yesterday, a bunch of us gathered for a conversation, really productive conversation. Where I'm going to want to turn it to you, John, is if I follow that narrative, and believe me, I've been in hundreds of examples of that narrative, and I've seen it uh, have a happy ending, and I've seen it have an unhappy ending. So where I want to turn it to you is uh, there's no question in my mind, particularly in today's labor market, that employers are doing all sorts of things they never imagined they'd, they'd need to do, right? So part of this is they're focused on running a successful business. Where I want to push is after that first job, how likely at scale and what models can you point to where it is genuinely a ladder? Uh, in my experience, uh, the, the, um, the intent may be there, the aspiration may be there. I think those systems largely are still to be built. So I, do, I wanna push a bit on this. I think there's a, a hopeful narrative, uh, and I say this as a community college president who talks all the time about I could care less about the degree, uh, frankly, as a piece of paper, but I care a whole lot about the degree as a proxy for who gets in and who gets left out. And so I'm going to turn it to you, John, and just ask you to reflect a little bit on what you've heard. Um, certainly challenge it. I'd also love to hear, again, sort of if you're a wizard, point us a way forward um, with this, I would say, relatively early stage that we're at. We're, we're doing some really fun work with employers who want simplicity, yeah. but who actually, given enough time, are willing to pay pretty much the full cost of a college education or a community college education past Pell and, and, other, and other government money that's already there. And, but, they, but it has to be simple. And the process of sourcing the right students, bringing them right at the front of the process, while you're getting admission, you're also getting a job offer. Mm -hmm. And then getting the funder, in our case, we're working with Stride. Mm -hmm. um, to put down the money so the school is getting its tuition, and then we're tracking the student, we're loving the student up, they're a Microsoft scholar, and, and the first job is before they graduate, but they're continuing on in their education and, uh, and staying with it until they've actually got a degree. So let me, let's keep this line going. Um, so I'm with you so far. Uh, so are you talking, and I know we have four-year colleagues in this room also, when you say degree, what do you mean? Two-year, two-year to four-year, and graduate school. Generally, you're not going to wait for somebody for four years, yeah. right? So there has to be something where I can wait a year or two as long as I have a steady pipeline and hundreds of students coming through it, but I can bring diverse talent to tech companies, to hospitals, to a bunch of people really looking for employees 
who are willing to pay, but not take risk, yeah. and not put out cash before the, the employees actually started. They don't want to chase after someone. They want it to be simple. They want to track as the student is going through the process. I think, I think it is the systems that can help schools as a group address, high, uh, address, uh, address corporate needs effectively. So I love, and I'm Julie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sure. We're gonna, you're just gonna be the wizard for the next five minutes. Um, where, is there a role for policy? And what's the role? Absolutely. Uh, I wouldn't be very good at my job if I said no. But you know, I think that there's two roles of policy. First of all, you pointed out, it's on top of Pell. Uh, so there's already a large amount of investment. And there's a lot of policy behind who gets grants and other kinds of aid and where they can take it. And I think we need to broaden the conversation about that with quality and a return on investment for, for learners, absolutely. But we need to think outside of the box of where they can go. Secondly, there's areas where policy can get out of the way. We make it incredibly difficult for learners who have stepped out of the system, who have stopped out of school, to get back into school and receive critical financial aid in order to pay for it. That's an area where policy absolutely can get out of the way by recognizing that pathways are not linear and that learners don't go through this very regimented high school to college to a job kind of degree. So I love what you said, and I heard two things. One, the simplicity theorem, which John led with, and then two, um, with all you know, apologies to folks that I that I might be offending. Um, the unnecessary complexity of policy and funding, you know, I've walked away. You know, I've been part of five-year grants where after the first year I've said, forget it. I'll raise the money on my own. It's killing my team just responding to managing the paperwork of this grant. So I'm looking at the time. We've got three minutes. Um, I'm gonna, I want two more, two more questions. One, I hope there's very robust uh, college participation in the audience. From the four of you, and I guess I will say for that group, other than frontline uh, healthcare workers, I wanna say to everyone in here that was leading organizations through this pandemic, we were in the trenches uh, serving our communities and trying to continue to deliver quality education. I say that, I would ask that you be um, honest and generous in how you answer this question. What, do you, what would you like my colleagues in this room to hear about colleges in this country and what we should prioritize in order to truly be effective partners with the kind of work that each of you is leading? I would add agility. Mm -hmm. If there was one thing we learned during the pandemic is the profound need to act fast whether that means flipping the switch on online learning, whether that meant switching up our curriculum to be more responsive to employer demands, um, or being agile in our own cybersecurity systems. But I think agility is one thing in our own partnerships with colleges could be better. You had me at hello. So the <laughs> people that I know in the room know I couldn't agree with you more um, from, from your mouth to God's ears. Uh, who else? I would say continue putting students at the center. What we saw in the pandemic of that agility of colleges to go online, to recognize students' childcare needs, to recognize their transportation needs, those things were there for learners before the pandemic. They're there if we're ever after the pandemic or whatever the new normal is. And that changing to have to fit the students' lives rather than expecting the students to fit an old, outdated system needs to continue. I'd say learn how to market. <laughs> um, <clears throat> colleges are the worst marketers as a group that I've seen. Um, an example is if you look at tuition. There have been thousands of articles about how much tuition has gone up over the past 20 years. The reality is net tuition is flat to inflation for 20 years, and there are no stories about that. And we tell our story just badly. We, we, we aren't, as a group, explaining why college is so helpful and what a good job, actually, that you guys are doing. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Look, let me just add one thing that is not related to skills, but it actually is, in, in my mind, the most needed skill for the country, and that is helping students, learners, develop the muscle to be good people, period. We need, we need to be good if we're gonna solve our issues. So I think that is actually a brilliant place to shut it down. I hope we get to do this again. Thank, all, thank you all four for joining in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.